Hi, I'm pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson and you're watching Get Your Sax Together where I sax up each and every Sunday for you with free online saxophone lessons for alto and tenor sax. On this week's show, by popular demand, you'll learn how to play Us and Them by Pink Floyd. I ummed and ahed when researching this video because Pink Floyd's Us and Them isn't exactly your standard eight bar pop solo, is it? The original track featured on the iconic 1973 album Dark Side of the Moon is just short of eight minutes and I couldn't decide if the intro is more important or the main solo or even those gorgeous fills in the verses. So I've just gone all in and you're gonna learn absolutely all the solo parts tenor saxophonist Dick Parry plays on the whole track. Why I do this to myself, I do not know, because it's a complete Everest of an editing job. Anyway, before we dive into this, don't forget to go down into the description for this video and click the link to get your free PDF sheet music for us and them, lovingly transcribed and copied for alto and tenor sax by yours truly. Plus, a lot of you have been asking for the backing tracks for these sax lessons, so keep watching right to the end of the video as I've provided all the backing tracks for you to play along with, yay. Finally, if you struggle with an inconsistent thin sound, low notes and high notes that split to the wrong octave, or you can't play in time properly, my saxophone success masterclass might be of interest to you. It's totally free, one hour lesson where you can get a bunch of my secret pro tips and tricks that aren't on YouTube to take your playing to the next level. Just click on the link in the description or go to getyoursaxtogether.com forward slash masterclass. We're gonna learn all the solo bits that Dick Parry plays on us and them in the order in which they come in the track. So let's get going with the 20 bar solo in the intro before the first vocal entry. An important note before you start learning the notes though, Dick Parry has a loose and idiosyncratic approach with many of his phrases seeming to float over the time, making them challenging to notate. You'll really have to listen to the original to get it. I'll even peel back the kimono and give you guys a bit of a shameful confession. I'm not proud to admit it, but I've always been a bit of a sax snob when it comes to solos like this. I know it's awful and you're all massively gonna hate on me, but I've always had a problem with the whole wild, wow, wow, self-taught sax sound thing. However, you'll be pleased to hear, creating content for this channel has been fantastic therapy for my little issue. And I've got to tell you, having immersed myself in this track and others like it, I've now got a whole new respect and appreciation for this kind of unschooled sax approach. It's vibey, man. And what more do you want at the end of the day, if not vibe? For me, vibe is king, even at the expense of technical expertise. But what do you think? I'm genuinely interested if it's solely my problem. Leave a comment below if you think I just need to get my head out of my backside, <laughs> or if certain unmentioned sax solos set your teeth on edge. Anyway, I've broken the intro solo into six phrases. At times, it's almost impossible to hear exactly what the notes are as they're buried in the mix. And I'm sure there'll be differences of opinion over notes and rhythms throughout, but Let's just call this transcription my best artistic interpretation. By the way, to make it easier to read, the whole solo is written in what we call cut common time, which means the crotchets or quarter notes go past quite quickly and the feel of the music is half the written time. Here's the first phrase broken down nice and slowly for you. <laughs> If you want to get that lush, jazzy subtone sound on the low notes like Dick Parry, go and check out my subtone video linked on the card above now. Many of these phrases just won't sound the same without that fluffy tone. Here's the second phrase now. <laughs> Throughout this track, Parry uses a lot of bends and scoops and stuff. Go to the video linked on the card above to learn how to do all that stuff. This third phrase goes to a low B on tenor, so I've taken it up the octave for alto as it goes off the bottom of the instrument. <laughs> Phrase four isn't officially too low for alto, but it does start on the lowest note of the instrument. So you might wanna take this phrase up the octave if it's too hard to get this uh, low A sharp out on alto. <laughs> Phrase 
Phrase five is where he steps up the intensity a bit. It really snarls off the last note. Here we go. To finish off the intro, here's phrase six. On the penultimate note, which is the D sharp for tenor, you could try using the side D sharp, which is like a high D sharp fingering, except without the octave key, as it's easier to slide down to the G sharp. This is one of these moments where it's impossible to hear exactly what the sax plays without an isolated sax stem from the mix, but I think it might be this. <laughs> So that's the whole intro solo covered. Straight after this solo, the vocals enter with us, us, us. Here's what this intro sounds like performed with my backing track at the actual tempo. Incidentally, when I was making the backing tracks, I had to go on YouTube myself to learn how to play the guitar part for this song. So it's not just you that uses free online music lessons. <laughs> Here we go. So the vocal comes in with verse one and Dick Parry plays two fills in the gaps. I've divided the first fill into two phrases. This first fill is a bit of an odd start. My best interpretation of what I hear is that he comes in on a long note in the second octave, but the note accidentally splits to the octave below, then he gets it back to the high octave. I'm not sure how you recreate this, to be honest. In the free PDF that you can get from the link in the description, I've written the high note tied over with the low note beneath. But you can either just play the long note and forget the octave split, or you can play the note in both octave like it actually sounds. I think I'd just kind of fudge it between the two, to be honest. This first fill comes after the lyric, Ordinary Men. Here we go. <laughs> Here's the second phrase of the first fill. So let's put those two phrases together and this is what the first fill sounds like with the backing track. The second fill in the opening verse comes just before the big chorus. When it gets to the chorus, there might be some sax, long notes or something uh, back in the mix, but as it's not really a solo, I've just ignored those bits. I've divided the second fill in the first verse into two phrases again. Here's the first phrase, which happens after the lyric we would choose. Here's the second phrase of the second fill. So now we can put those two phrases together into the second fill at the end of the first verse section of the song. After the massive chorus, it drops back down again for the second verse and we get another fill. This third fill comes after the lyric, who is who, and I've divided it into three parts. Here's the first phrase. Here's the 
Now phrase two of the third fill. The third phrase of this fill is pretty loose, so check out the original for the exact timing. So that completes the third fill. Let's put it together now with the backing track. Here we go. Okay, so after another big chorus and a 20 bar piano solo, we get to the main event, the main sax solo. This one really builds as it gets into the big chorus section, super intense. I've divided this solo section into nine different parts. Like I said in the intro, this lesson was always gonna be on the epic side. <laughs> okay, here's the first phrase. The second phrase is pretty loose. The last measure seems to start with a triplet that's really just a lip bend. Again, check out the original to see what you think it is. Third phrase finishes with these triplets that have lip bends. I say lip bends, I wouldn't really ever do lip bends like this myself, I would use my throat, but it sounds like they're played as lip bends. Now the fourth phrase of the main solo. Phrase five is arguably the hardest thing to actually play in the whole solo. Parry plays this triplet run straight up to the big chorus section. It's just a constant D major scale, but it's fairly fast. If you wanna get your scales together for moments like this, but you don't know how best to do it, go and check out my video linked up there on the card, which is the best way to practice your scales without wasting your time. Here's phrase five. The impassioned wailing continues into phrase six. Phrase seven has actually got a pretty tricky rhythm in it. At first I thought it was just a loose thing, but on closer inspection it's actually a really tight double time rhythm. You might need to work this one out slowly and gradually increase the tempo until you've got it down. Phrase eight is really fun. If you're playing tenor, you just trill your fingers as fast as you can from C sharp to E. Normally I would do this trill with the front E, but it doesn't sound like he does that to be honest. If you're an alto, you can keep your G sharp key down for the trill and just trill fingers two and three with your left hand. Or you could be really flash and trill those two keys by bringing your right hand over the top. <laughs> if you wanna see what I'm talking about, check out the video linked above. 
This part of the solo is really full on and wild, but here it is broken down in a rather more sober way. Finally, here's phrase nine. This one tails off into reverb at the end and I couldn't really hear what it does, but I think it's just a final long note that fades out. Jeezy peeps, man, that is a lot of stuff to learn. Anyway, we're now ready to piece together the whole main solo. So here it is with the backing track. So we're almost there now. After the big sax solo, it comes down again for our last double verse, verse three, and there's fills in the second half of this verse. Really, it's two fills with six bars in between, but I've just treated it as one fill and it's divided into four phrases. Here's the first part of our fill four then. This comes after the lyric with, and it's super quiet and buried in the mix. <laughs> The second phrase is also very mellow. Phrases three and four are one phrase and joined straight into each other, but I had to divide it into two as it was too long. So here's phrase three of that fourth fill section. As I mentioned, this final phrase of the whole thing flows straight from the end of the previous phrase. Here's phrase four, the very final phrase in the whole thing, yay. Now we can string together all those parts into the second half of verse three and perform them with the backing track. This is the final bit of sax solo in the whole track. As promised, here's all the backing tracks now for you to play along with. As always, it's super important to go and carefully check out the original lines to really get the vibe and the feel right.
Wowza. It's been an epic. Between this one and last week's deep dive video into the blues, I think I need a holiday. But of course, I couldn't possibly deny you your Sunday fix of gay sex together. In fact, spoiler intended, next Sunday we go from the wild and loose work of Dick Parry to the other end of the spectrum, the flawless technical precision of Gerald Albright on Patrice Russian's Forget Me Nots. One of my favourite sax solos of all time. As usual, you can help me out by subscribing to the channel, ring the bell to be notified of new uploads, give me a thumbs up and a comment, and check out the socials as well, Instagram and my new Facebook page. As always, thanks for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday for more premium YouTube sax content. See you later. Phrase five is where he steps up the intensity, the inten uh, go back, just stumbled that one. Phrase five is what is what? Stumblefish. Phrase five is where <laughs> what? <laughs>